You're listening to Innovation for Alpha, where we explore everything at the intersection of healthcare innovation and finance. Through our discussions and interviews, we keep you informed and educated about healthcare innovations, next level venture investing, and everything involving the combination of the two. Hi, everybody. This is Tobin Arthur with the Innovation for Alpha podcast, and I am very pleased today to be joined by Matt Patsky, who is the CEO of Trillium uh, Asset Management, an incredible ESG fund based out of Boston, but we're going to learn more about Trillium. But first, I want to learn more about Matt and uh, his really interesting background. Matt, welcome and good morning to you. Good morning, Tobin. Thank you for having me on. Well, it's a real pleasure, and I'm, I'm really excited to continue to get to know you. Maybe just tell everybody a little bit more about yourself, Matt, and then, you know, kind of a little bit about your background. Sure. Um, I started my career at uh, Lehman Brothers, and, and yes, that Lehman Brothers, and I was hired as a technology analyst, and um, in, in that, for those who know the history of the firm, we had acquired uh, E.F. Hutton in 1988, and, and in that merger, I was asked to um, move into emerging growth and uh, consumer emerging growth specifically. And I was looking at characteristics of building sustainable franchises and discovered the, um, what, what I now know to be true, which is that environmental, social, and governance characteristics are absolutely material to the long-term sustainability of business franchises. And um, so I built that into everything I started doing in 88 on the consumer side um, and, uh, and started recognizing um, how, how, how it was true again across every sector. And so um, my, my initial, um, some of the initial names that, that people would know is I, I had picked up coverage on companies like Ben & Jerry's, the Body Shop International, um, which were some of the early um, I would call them social enterprises that had come public um, and, and, uh, and was uh, doing a lot of work in the private side of lo looking and meeting companies that I thought would might likely come public in the future. So I got to meet pre-IPO, the management team, uh, you know, Howard Schultz at Starbucks and John Mackey at Whole Foods Markets and um, you know, and on and on, you know, there were, there were a number of interesting companies that I got to go and meet and, and, and they would later come public. And, and so I, I, I uh, that was the, that was sort of the start of the, of my research effort, looking into um, ESG integrated sustainability, sustainable investing. That's really neat. You know, and two things come to mind about that. First of all, did you have a sense at the time you know, when you were meeting some of these entrepreneurs and some of these companies pre-public, did you have a sense that these were going to become iconic brands or was it really an unknown still at the time? Uh, that, that was my, my, my obvious belief was that, that we were in the early days of a, of a transition that was going to bring a bunch of these brands forward as, as um, you know, really iconic brands. I mean, not, not every one of the people I was meeting would, would, go, would go on to such incredible prominence and success. Um, a bunch of them, matter of fact, would get acquired before they would go public. So um, I, I remember spending a, a lot of time with Gary Hirschberg, who had founded Stonyfield Farms Yogurt. And, and, and while we, if people know the brand now, it was, um, you know, it was Group Danone out of Paris, you know, out of France that, that, that really um, brought that to being a, a, a global brand, right? Um, so... Um, I would say I would say it was more identifying the trend. I think what what you step back and look at and realize um, and, and trying to picture the whole is that if you can engage your customer in in a um, in a belief that you're more than just providing a product, you're going to end up with the loyalty of that customer, and and that is also true with your employees. And so you're going to end up with lower uh, turnover, you're gonna, low, you're gonna end up with happier employees, you're gonna end up with better customer service experiences, and you're gonna end up with more loyal customers. For, for me, it started by spending time on the issue of human capital and human and, and talent management, which wasn't even called talent management back in 1988. And, and it was, um, I 
<clears throat> as an analyst would start every review of a company, every due diligence session with a company, for me started with an hour long conversation with the uh, HR department. And, and, and to this day, when you go and ask for that, you get the same response from the IR department. You, they'll always say, well, no, no one else asks to see the, to talk to the HR department. And I'm like, yeah, well, that's a big part of a business, isn't it? It's uh, human, human capital management, you know, the, the, how, how you're treating your people. And so it, it's, it was, it was eye opening because you got to see just such incredibly um, very distinct approaches. And, and um, if you treated your people as easily replaceable and many companies, particularly in fast service concepts like Starbucks, that was the history. It's like, I'm hiring kids that, you know, who are in high school or coming out of high school, you know, at minimum wage, and I'm not providing them any benefits. And if, if they don't like it, they'll leave and I'll get another one, right? The idea that you were actually, no, this was about, you know, trying to build loyalty with your employees that would build on the customer experience that would build loyalty with your customers wasn't a very uh, broadly held belief um, in, 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 in uh, you know, in, in retail and, and in, and in um, fast food service. And so um, it, it was kind of an, an obvious to me. I'm like, oh my God, this is it. This is the future. And this is where we're going to be building the, the, the brands that are going to have staying power. And so I think that was the, the aha moment, if it were, in, 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 the, in that period of time. The belief of, in the, in the early period for my career, the, um, I'm just going to give you this anecdote because it's going to really, um, I think, help people understand how um, uncommon it was, right? Um, it was, um, from, from my perspective, and a number of, of, of the early players in this space was, was clear that this information was material, the environmental, social, and governance factors, um, even though we weren't necessarily articulating ESG as a concept, we were articulating all these environmental and social impacts and the governance profile of a company. And, um, and that as a, somebody who was responsible for helping people on making decisions on investment, it was my fiduciary duty to incorporate these factors and to talk about them, right? But I went in, um, and this is, um, I'm just trying to remember the exact, it was 1989. I went in with a well-articulated business plan. I will admit it wasn't very long. It was about four pages, but I went into the associate director of research at Lehman Brothers. And I said, I, I think I have a way in which we can differentiate Lehman. Now, you may know from, for those who have history that Lehman at the time was really well known for its fixed income. It was trying to make its way into competing with the bigger players in the equity markets. It wasn't a big player in capital markets and equities. And so I came in and I said, and we had, I will say this, we had built a really good, um, strong reputation in, in equity research, but we still didn't have very much market share. And, and so we were, we were struggling. And I said, I, if we were to incorporate environmental, social, and governance factors across all sectors and were to apply this and, in, in, you know, like look at, and I was, I remember specifically talking about the chemical industry, we would end up only <clears throat> putting on the buy list, the companies that had strong environmental profiles, those are gonna be the companies that are gonna be gaining market share, particularly as regulatory starts to put pressure on making sure there's, you know, it's not just compliance, it's about making sure externalities are put back onto the company and the risk profile, right, of companies who've done things that are wrong. We're gonna end up being the preferred investment bank to all of the best companies and the best franchises across every sector. And we're also gonna be seen as, and this is the term I probably, where I probably went astray. I said, we're gonna be seen as the socially responsible investment bank. And Fred Frankel leaned in and he said, Matt, it's really nice that you care about these issues. If you don't stop, it'll destroy your career. 
right? So we, that was the mindset, right? Was I would say 5% of us were all living in a world where we're saying this is important and 95% were all laughing at the 5% telling us that that was not true and it's not going to matter and you're and you're just going to end up you know losing people money putting them into you know responsible companies what's that about and 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 you know but there were enough of us who believed that we were organized and i became part of the social venture network back then i became uh, active in what was social investment forum back then and, and you got to meet people who would reinforce that this wasn't crazy. And the, the one, um, one person I'd call out for, for helping me stay the course was a gentleman named Peter Kinder, uh, who ended up going on to follow, you know, to follow, um, founding KLD, Kinder Leidenberg Domini, which was the first data source for ESG. And I remember him walking me around um, in, in uh, it was actually, I think, Mohawk Mountain, resort and I remember him saying you're not crazy you're just early right and I was like I'm not crazy I'm just early and so now I look back and I'm like yeah I was really early <laughs> so I'm gonna start using that I love that I'm gonna start telling myself when I tell myself when I'm having some self-doubt you're not crazy just early that's right, brilliant right, right. <laughs> so um, and that really helped set me up to, to, to try to then look at it from this from a different perspective, which was how are we as a, a, a both me individually, but we as a community of people who are recognizing this early, going to educate and 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 promote this concept so that we're not the only ones looking at this. And so um, and, and it you know it obviously has worked over time, but. What's, what's been happening is language has shifted dramatically over time. And so we went from talking about socially responsible investing to ESG investing to now the distinction between what is ESG investing versus impact investing is an important distinction to make because it's about intentionality of what you're trying to accomplish. If you're merely wrecking, and, and, and I think this is true with now, almost everybody is coming to the, rec the realization that environmental, social, and governance information is material, and therefore, at least from a risk mitigation, uh, you know, side of, of investing, you need to be looking at it and factoring that into your investment process. But what about what is the intentionality about what I'm trying to accomplish, and am I trying to move toward having positive social and environmental impact? And if I'm trying to make that next step of trying to have positive social and environmental impact, there's additional steps you need to take, right? It's not just about where you put your money. It's also about you have to be an active, engaged owner. You have to be pressing the company for improved outcomes. You have to be voting your proxies in a way which is supportive of that. There's a whole bunch of steps that need to be there. And that's kind of the next layer of what I think people need to be talking about. And I... I, I, uh, I was just actually talking to somebody this morning about this. I said, I, I, I am amazed at how often you'll be sitting and talking to someone and they'll, and they'll share their, their agony of deciding whether or not they're going to buy an organic banana versus an organic fair trade banana or a fair trade banana versus a conventional banana. And, 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 and they're you know, confused and they're not sure which one they should be, you know, how, how much difference does it make? And I'm like, Stop worrying about the goddamn banana and worry, worry about where your money's invested. Because most people don't even know where their money's invested. And, you know, the number of people who say, oh, I, someone else handles that. Or I just have that in my 401k plan in a target date fund. And I'm like, well, where's your target date fund invested? Well, I don't know. Well, <clears throat> it's important that you know money has impact. Certainly, I do want you to buy the organic fair trade banana. That's true. But I, 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 you know, the impact you're having with that one purchase is, is you know, limited. The impact you have on how you invest your 401k plan has incredible impact. Why? Because you know, when you go to your HR department and say, I've noticed we only have target date funds and traditional um, you know, market index funds, I want a fund that is addressing the most pressing social and environmental issues. 
in our options, you're actually changing not just for you, you're changing it for all your colleagues, the options. And, and that needs to happen and people need to, need to be more aggressive on that. And, and uh, it's still amazing, 90% uh, roughly of, of retirement assets in, in, within uh, company 401k plans are still invested in target date funds. It's also true with all the educational um, trusts that are, 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 you know, that states have around the country. And, um, and that's, a, that's a disconnect from values. Like that's, that's, a, that's a statement, all right. It's a statement that, and it might be a statement that you don't know, and I get that, but it's a statement of, you know, ultimately that there's a no, no concern about the impacts of money, right? Because the impacts of investing in a traditional target date fund is you own everything. And you clearly, by owning everything, are having negative impact in the world. Here's the interesting truth: while conventional wisdom, for certainly while um, I, you know, when we look 30 years ago, 25 years ago, you know, um, well, as long as five years ago, you still had the majority of people had a belief, <clears throat> and it was, if I consider factors other than financial, it'll negatively impact returns, and therefore. Right, um, you know, it's a it's a question of the sacrifice in return, and I and I and I uh, I'm going to share just another quick anecdote. Sorry, but I'm going to share another quick anecdote because it was so amazing to me. I presented to a environmental endowment in Boston. The investment committee had asked me to come in to present um, one of our um, options, and it was a, a, a you know a, a, an option which obviously we were uh, talking about positive environmental impact. I went through and talked about the portfolio, its construction, and that actually for over 20 years, it, it, the, the, um, the, 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 this had been fossil fuel free. Literally the chair of the investment committee asked for a meeting afterwards. And he came to my office, I wanna say it was the next day, to tell me that he was disturbed that I had presented fraudulent numbers because what we had shown was that we had delivered better performance with lower volatility than the broad market. And I just looked at him and I said, but, but these numbers were audited. And he said, well, it's not possible because modern portfolio theory states that if you limit the investable universe, you necessarily will increase risk and reduce returns. And my response was, it's called a theory for a reason and it's wrong. And all of the factual evidence for 40 years has shown it's wrong, but there are still people who, yes, that's what they were trained in their MBA program in the 1970s, and they're wed to it, and they won't let go. And, and this was just an example, but, but in the, the answer is, I'm investing in companies that are faster growing because they're positioned for where the market's moving. And I'm divested from companies that are in legacy industries that are actually in secular decline. And so I would be hard pressed to deliver worse returns given that I'm investing in companies of the future and divesting from companies of the past. I love that. Well said. It's sort of the Wayne Gretzky's I'm going where the puck is, you know, go where the puck is going, not where the puck is. Right. Um, in, uh, you know, I want to shift just a little bit because I think in a future conversation, like I said, there's a number of really interesting things that you've you've hit on. I'd love to come back in more detail, but let's talk a little bit about Trillium. Just maybe give everybody a little bit of the background of Trillium and then, you know, bring them to the current and present, you know, yeah. what you're focused on now. Sure. So um, Trillium was founded by a woman who was a true pioneer in this field and, and, and she, uh, Joan Bavaria, and Joan had started her career in the trust department of Bank Boston. Um, and, her, and her background's interesting because she had, a, um, uh, she had gone to school for music. She had ended up taking an administrative job in Bank of Boston in the trust department and they quickly realized how sharp she was and they trained her and promoted her to be a trustee. And then they gave her, because she was one of the only women trustees, they gave her the accounts that were predominantly women. Um, and she was finding that they were increasingly asking questions about the portfolio. This is uh, the, the, the mid 70s. So why do I own this stock? 
I don't want to own a company that does that. You know, I don't want to own a company that that's um, you know making weapons. I don't want to own a company that's that that's in the oil industry. I don't want to own a company, right? So she was facing demands from the the client to change the portfolio, and so she went about starting to design a portfolio looking at risk characteristics, but replacing companies that her clients didn't want to own, and she was being you know, basically told constantly that ultimately she was going to get herself in trouble. She was violating the prudent man rule. She was in violation of her fiduciary duty. You can't mix values in an investment portfolio. You can't possibly look at these characteristics. This is, this is going to get you in trouble. And she realized <clears throat> after delivering lower risk and higher returns that maybe there's a business model in this. And so in 19, uh, it was actually 1981, she went and set up the shop. And in 1982, she filed, uh, she, she had uh, enough, uh, enough assets under management that she filed as a registered investment advisor with the SEC and launched the firm, um, and, you know, and in that, and that uh, with the, the mission of to provide for the financial needs of our clients while leveraging their capital for positive social and environmental impact in alignment with their values. So a lot of, a lot of attributes there are unique. Number one, she was kind of one of the first players to say, it's not acceptable. And I say this because there were, there were uh, the initial launches of what were labeled socially responsible funds actually did lean on the excuse of, well, if you're going to do good, you probably can't make as much money. And she was like, no, that's actually backwards. If you're doing the right thing, you should actually be able to deliver alpha. And, and she was one of the first to actually sort of put that out there into the universe as a concept in the United States was, no, no we're looking at it backwards. This, this is not, you know, modern portfolio theory has it wrong. When you look at these characteristics, you should enhance return, not harm return. You should reduce risk not increase risk. Um, and she was right, right? And, and um, so she also was taking a page from what she saw from the trade unions, who at the time were one of the only players that actually understood the power of ownership and that they could use that ownership position to leverage pushing companies to change behavior. And, and no, no asset managers were doing that at the time. And by the way, at the time, none of the municipal and state pension plans were doing it either. So she started basically engaging companies in dialogue about changes she wanted to see as the firm was being founded. And that is probably the, you know, what is the most distinguishing feature of Trillium versus asset managers to this day is most companies don't have a real robust effort to try to change behavior at the companies they hold. And, um, and, and that's where I would say is, is probably um, what people most know us for. You know, to that point, there's been a lot of discussion in recent years about these large index funds, robo funds that hold huge controlling interests, don't vote their proxies. So you've got these enormous ownership positions that essentially are absentee owners, if you will. Yep. Um, how do you guys think about that? Obviously, you're active investors, but how does that you know play into the market? Well, it's 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 um, an incredibly negative impact in the market if the um, your management team gets to the point where they realize their biggest holders don't care what they do, right? And that's how you can get to the spiraling, um, increasing pay packages, but nobody paying attention. Um, I, I, uh, I'm just going to, I spoke to a group of, of corporate directors at a conference here in Boston and about 500 people in the room. And I asked that this question, which is sort of shows part of the problem, which is I said, how many of you work at a firm in which your CEO is in the bottom half and in, within the industry and, and nobody raised their hand and everybody laughed. And I said, well, how many of you 
are working on a board where your CEOs are in the top quartile, and they all raise their hand. And I'm like, all right, this is the problem. You statistically are all chasing top quartile compensation, which means it just keeps spiraling up. And this is how you get to 340 times average worker comp for the average CEO. This is the problem. You're, you're not dealing with reality. You aren't properly marking and, and, and you know, the performance of your, you know, so that starts there, but then you don't have the owners paying any attention. You know, that's incredibly destructive to capitalism. That's incredibly dangerous, right? And, and we need there to be, we need the owners to be active. We need the regulatory framework to be um, also constructive toward um, sustainable business models. It's a good point, you know, and I don't want to get too far onto this tangent, but I'd love you just to comment a little bit on the Wall Street Journal had an article a number of months back, and I thought it was interesting. And, and they were picking in particular, I think, on BlackRock. Uh, BlackRock was launching or has launched a big ESG fund. And the Wall Street Journal, the gist of the uh, article was essentially that BlackRock is robbing pension owners of alpha in the in the name of you know, something that BlackRock can use as a marketable tool, but really just an excuse to extract big fees. F yeah. Fair or not? And then again, it's not so, really about BlackRock. Well, here, here's where it's fair. And here's where uh, I'm going to say um, that, that, you know, that that's a little bit of a, a, you know, maybe too simplistic a way of looking at it. But it is true that by slapping ESG onto a fund label, you are able to charge a premium. And, and way too many uh, products are out there that are mislabeled, right? And the SEC is trying to get down to saying, well, well, tell us what you mean by ESG. Because if that's all you did was buy one set of data and did a, a layover and took out the bottom quartile of how MSCI scores it, that's not really ESG integrated. And you shouldn't call it an ESG fund, period. It's just not. Now, if it's if it's that you're considering ESG characteristics in a in a more thoughtful way and incorporating it into the investment process, that's an ESG uh, fund, and 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 we can you know we may agree or disagree with methodology, right? Because you could say I'm putting in the top quartile of every industry sector, and so I'm going to have quote the 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 most environmentally friendly oil companies are going into my portfolio, and and I, I don't like, you know, that's not how we're investing, but it's legitimate in that you're saying, I'm looking for the industry leaders, um, environmental leaders in each industry. Um, and so I think that's what we got to get. We've got to get the public to be a little bit more sophisticated to just say, well, what, what exactly are they doing? And if they're actually doing a thorough job, is it worth a premium? Well, the answer is it should be because they should also be delivering a premium on returns. And, and you know, the, the ultimate way I, my, my test for everybody is this, if through a full market cycle, your strat, the strat, you know, the portfolio you own or the, the investment advisor you're using hasn't actually delivered enough outperformance after their fee that you're seeing that you're doing better than just buying the market, fire them because they should be able to do that. And I understand that statistically, something like 80% of them don't. Right. I was so, going to say, Matt, stop. That's way too commonsensical. How can, you, <laughs> how can you say such a thing? But, you know, to your point, you know, Warren Buffett is an example. And, and actually, in yeah. an interview I heard the other day with um, uh, Oak Tree's, um, you know, founder, and Howard Marks, he was saying kind of something similar, which is, you're a hard press to find active managers, active portfolio managers that are going to beat the market. You know, they'll all claim they do, of course. And, right. and to your point, the, the, the real number is after fees. And so what right. are they doing to justify those fees? And if the answer is very little to nothing, then stick your money in an index fund. And, you know, I, and I, I'm not making that well, suggestion. You move your money or move your money to an investor who's doing it. But Fair well, point. you can yeah. also look at you know, the, 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 so far we're looking at the results of some of the really better done index. I mean, there is, there's passive product that's coming out. I would argue passive product in general is difficult right now because we don't have, the data sets aren't rich enough and deep enough 
to really get a full accurate picture, but it's getting better. And so the opportunity to invest in a more robust ESG integrated product that's passive out 10 years from now is gonna be very real. We're gonna see that. Um, right now it's a little difficult. And, and so yes, um, it, you know, I'm biased, I'm an active manager, but I do think that active management has an advantage over passive for truly integrating ESG. And, and, uh, and I'll also say, you know, we haven't seen yet a lot of passive managers also being active owners, right? So look forward 10 years, there'll be passive strategies where the manager is an active owner and is trying to use that power of ownership to get positive environmental and social change out of companies. And that'll be good. That'll be a good day. Right? Yeah, that's a that's a whole other interesting topic. And um, so many, so many interesting things here. We're going to have future discussions to dive into some of them. Um, you know, Matt, you're such an interesting person with an incredible background. Maybe we can just wrap up today. I want to hit a little bit more kind of almost going back full circle on the personal side. Just, and, and you know, I want to talk more about Trillium at some point and some of the things that you're looking at there. And, and, you know, even on the capital raising side, as you guys, you know, build that part of the business, I think people, you know, would be fascinated in terms of how does somebody build a firm like you have built, but let's just wrap up with, um, talk about in a given weekend, what are some of your favorite things to do, uh, whether it's in Boston or going out to the Cape or, or, you know, what, what's your perfect weekend look like? Okay. So my perfect weekend is we go out to Provincetown in the Cape. And I will say, I can feel my blood pressure come down as soon as we cross the Sagamore Bridge. And I don't know what that's about. Obviously, it's psychological, but it is literally like, I'm, I'm here. And, um, and so that, that's, that's the perfect weekend is just simply relaxing, spending time with friends, um, going out to dinner, taking walks in Provincetown. And um, yeah. So that would be my that would be my absolute perfect weekend, and and we're not doing it this weekend, but we are next weekend. Well, Matt, thanks a ton for taking time out. This has been a, a great conversation. Like I said, there's so many different uh, angles we can take here with your background. It's a fascinating background. You've been a big part of the evolution in the financial industry and around this this whole area. And I everything you're saying, I'm tracking with the. You know, even the idea of just being more intentional about uh, impact investing and the and the, maybe the evolution from the term ESG. So, thanks for sharing some of these insights, and I look forward to more conversations. Well, thank you, appreciate it, and look forward to to talking again. See you again soon for the next episode of Innovation for Alpha. Make sure to go to Innovation for Alpha for access to prior episode links, show notes, and other valuable resources. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any investment decisions, please consult with a professional. This show is copyrighted by Angel Indie Media, and written permission must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting.